Well, everybody, I, I know that uh, I'm the last thing eating uh, lunch, so I'll try and get through this. I didn't, didn't do a 90 second slide because I thought I could have a 90 minutes. So we'll try and pack it fast. Um, we're going to talk about different unmanned aircraft systems that we've tested in different scales, either directly for enforcement and surveillance or in different areas, or, or show data that they've acquired to kind of make a sort of a, a case of what makes sense for, for the kinds of places that we look at. Um, so we can format the issues. Um, so a brief history of how we uh, test the systems, uh, looking at marine resource monitoring and enforcement applications. Um, Looking, looking at what's over the horizon. Hopefully we'll have a minute or two to, to go at the end. So there's, there's four real categories of unmanned aircraft systems. That's how the military and FAA class them. From high altitude, long endurance, that includes platforms like the Global Hawk, which we talked about just briefly yesterday. Medium altitude, long endurance, most familiar to most people, would probably be the Predator class, but also the Scanning Mode, which we also discussed a little bit yesterday, fits into that, that, that realm. Uh, low, low altitude, long endurance, uh, I'll show a couple slides. Uh, that would be the Aerosan, um, which I'll show you and explain it. And mostly what I'm going to talk about is low altitude, short endurance. These are small UAS. And these are the things that the FAA is going to be uh, opening up a little. Well, we don't know how much or exactly, or even exactly when, but supposedly within the next year, there'll be new regulations that will open up some commercial applications for, for systems for the products. So you hear a lot uh, uh, about unmanned aircraft systems making sense for the dirty, dull, and dangerous missions, and that's really sort of how the military looks at. But, but I think for the work that we do, there, there's some other attributes that are worth mentioning. Um, remote. The more remote you get, the, the more sense it makes, especially if you're getting there on a ship, uh, to have the ability to extend your effective area of uh, uh, being able to survey or, or or scan the ocean or the shore. Also, a lot of the small systems are very quiet and very stealthy. After all, these, the, the ones that were designed for the military were designed to be over the horizon situational awareness tools, relatively expendable at that. Um, so they're stealthy by design. So they, they're very innocuous, most of them. They, they don't disturb sensitive organisms when you're surveying. Uh, and it's actually also hard to see them if you're being surveyed, if you're a person or a poster. Uh, also, you can get a persistence out of something that you may not have thought about. Even if it only has a battery to fly for, for two hours, uh, usually you can turn them around in a matter of minutes or you bring more than one airframe and you can be up all day long. And you can, uh, many of them will allow you to lock a pixel on a target. Uh, those that have payloads that actually have a gimbal, uh, which means you can get a stable center of field of view photograph for a very, very long time. Longer and often better. You know, than you can I can't show you the rest of that slide. Um, so where do we start? Uh, in the upper left, you see Altair. That was a pre-production Predator B. We partnered with General Atomics who built the system in NASA in 2005 for a pilot project that was really looking at you know, how can we start to implement this kind of technology in NOAA. And that was, I think we, we heard about the that Frank and I yesterday, I call this the Frank and payload. We, we put together a payload that wasn't really optimized for any one no activity, but, but it was representative of many. And we collected a lot of data and looked at it and realized we should keep pursuing this. And so from the UAS project through the UAS program office, and, and I've kind of been involved since the beginning there, late 2004. Um, lower right, and we're kind of going through the big scale stuff first, is, is that's a global lock. That's a that is a obsolete military jet-powered unmanned aircraft that uh, North Carolina built. They, this is sort of the first block, if you will, of, of them. There were there were three blocks. The, the third is still being used for something. This first class of them, um, uh, NASA has three at the uh, in the Mojave Desert at what's now the Armstrong Flight Research Center. They've been reconfigured to support science. We have several NOAA Corps officer pilots that are on detail to NASA helping fly these, and we, we fund uh, 
a lot of payloads and missions on these. They're mostly being used now for uh, sort of pseudo satellites. Uh, and they're being used for advanced weather and, and climate change kind of research. It's not to say they couldn't carry instruments that might be very, very interesting uh, for marine protected areas, surveillance, large scale areas, you know, anywhere in the world. We take a 13,000 mile range, they can carry a couple thousand pounds of instrumentation. Compartments that are pressurized and unpressurized, that you know, can be in the airflow or not. So they're it's an interesting idea. These were you know, 60 plus million dollars new, obsoleted, you know, within a decade or so of being built because they built bigger ones to haul bigger telescopes, basically. But the point is, some of this equipment, you know, it, it, it would fly for 30 years like most airplanes, but it's becoming obsolete technologically on something you know closer to Moore's law. So you know start thinking about it, you know, what can you pick up for nothing to reconfigure. Some very expensive, very capable equipments out there. The middle slide um, I, I kind of added in because it's 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 tangent to marine protected area stuff, but the whole ghost net and, and persistent marine debris issue. And we've been studying this and, and supporting the OS Marine Marine Debris Office, um, helping test different parts of this concept, which I call plane strength and automobiles. But what you have in the upper right is a satellite. We've proven a couple times by flying out to the garbage patch in the North Pacific Convergence Zone that we can find high density areas of marine debris where you know, we can find the garbage patch. And so satellites help us do that. I won't get into how, but it works. Um, and the idea here is instead of having people cut the nets out manually in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, for example, each summer. Um, and they're already into the reefs and the atolls on the beaches. The, beta, the holy grail is to get them to sea. So in this concept, we have a satellite help us get a ship in the vicinity. Then we have a global hawk or a predator flying probably a synthetic aperture radar payload uh, that it can actually image the surface of the sea and show you micro circulatory features and buoys and things like that that would be trained and would indicate nets. Uh, and then a small unmanned aircraft that, that the ship would carry uh, that would vector the ship to individual nets in a high density area. So we're talking about something that could fly at 50 knots if you launch in the covered sea, vectoring the ship that could go 10. Again, all about that that sea. So flying a predator or a global hawk predator um, and this, of course, much of this was building a payload, payload, but the point is, it takes a village. <laughs> it's a big, expensive undertaking. Um, the Global Hawk probably takes an army. Um, th this is the NASA Global Hawk Operations Center. In front of the glass wall are the operators that are actually flying and monitoring the, uh, the health of the aircraft. Behind the glass wall is the science party, people that are dealing with the payload. Um, so uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of labor involved in making these things happen. Upper left is Ikana. So following that Predator uh, testing, NASA actually bought an MQ-9 Predator B. It's named Ikana. It's, it's, uh, it's not weaponized. It's, it's for science. And um, we're taking it for the first time out into the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands this summer. It's out there to support uh, RIMPAC, which is actually a military exercise, but it's just to provide energy. And it's going to be configured as a Coast Guard slash CBP Guardian uh, with synthetic aperture radar, really powerful optics, and AIS. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that payload, how we're going to use it, and why uh, this coming summer. This is a big event. We had intended to take Altair in 2005 out to do that, and we didn't get to. Um, below is a, a Scan Eagle a recovery on a small boat. Um, I'll talk about where I think the Scan Eagle might fit into a big strategy uh, later in my talk. To the right, um, Manta, uh, one of the systems that we do own and, and we use occasionally for most of your quality work. There's the Arison, uh, also in 2005, I believe, before it was uh, launched. I believe that was into Hurricane Ophelia. Uh, again, some, some products that we have in our inventory that we were from the early days. <coughs> Here's a Scan Eagle uh, that was deployed on a, on a NOAA ship, or at least this represents that mission uh, where we were in the Arctic uh, to 
survey and characterize uh, four different types of Arctic seals in 2009. Uh, one thing I'll mention about this, uh, although we thought the test was really successful, up until the last minute, we thought we were going to be able to fly 50 miles away from the ship. And unfortunately, the week before the FAA is co their certificate of authorization that was required for us to operate in the National Air Space, reduced us to only five miles. And so there, there's a lot of things that we've been able to test or prove here and there, but we can't really do operationally yet because of, because of the rules and policies. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, we own a few different kinds of quadricopters and hexacopters. We've tested them uh, doing a lot of wildlife survey. Um, generally, uh, I, I think not very effective tools for MPA uh, enforcement. So they don't have the range. They, they, because it takes so much electrical power to get them airborne that they, they, they don't fly for very long. They do, however, have uh, some really interesting applications. They, they provide very stable, very, very high resolution imagery. So we do use them for some things, but, but not for um, we've tested different schemes. We've tested different schemes to um, launch and recover. Uh, I made aircraft from vessels, and uh, the systems that we're using regularly are simply hand launched and, and recovered in the water. It's the most reliable way to do it. Um, we are moving with uh, Aero Environment. We've manufactured the system that we use the most. Uh, towards uh, testing some net capture for remote areas and operating from ships. Uh, and that's only in places where it's actually more dangerous to put people in the water to recover the, uh, the aircraft. Or uh, we're operating from a large vessel where the captain doesn't want to stop the ship to recover a 13 pound aircraft. But, but generally, um, we like to recover them in the water. Um, so again, back to our sort of most recent history and the work we've done the most with the small aircraft system, the Puma. Uh, we acquired two brand new Puma unmanned aircraft systems uh, from Aero Environment through a contract vehicle that the Army had. This is military hardware. This was uh, developed for the Special Operations Command. We've got 1,000 of these in production now. Uh, this is sister to the Raven, which is the most prolific unmanned aircraft system in the DOD inventory. Um, after looking at a whole lot of systems, uh, we realized we needed to buy things that had extensive uh, training, parts, availability, uh, ability to be successfully launched and recovered at sea. And there are only a couple systems on the market, at least in the last few years, that, 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 that can really do all those things. Uh, not inexpensive, uh, but when you look at these things, it, it's about it's over $300,000 per system. Uh, if you look at them as a ship data acquisition system. You're talking about ships that cost twenty to thirty thousand dollars a day in the only way plus the cost of twenty to forty people on it. Um, in fact it only costs pennies a day to operate. Um, it, it becomes it makes a lot of sense if, if the cost becomes become down to weeds uh, operational day by day. So um, we've been working the past two and a half years uh, using National Marine Sanctuary sites as laboratories to develop the protocols and procedures for various missions and identifying the ones that the Puma system does best. And uh, we've done a lot of marine resource surveys and we're producing slides. Uh, a fair amount of uh, enforcement work uh, in Hawaii, California, and Florida. Um, done some mapping, uh, supported some oil spill drills, working a lot with the Marine Debris Program. And we took a system up to the Arctic last year with the Coast Guard. I will say that uh, MPA enforcement, fisheries enforcement, is one of the killer apps in our opinion for producing small UAS and nighttime especially. So a quick run through on, on the Puma AE, uh, nine foot wingspan, 13 pounds, built of carbon fiber, electrically powered. Uh, it is uh, controlled through this little hand controller, which runs through a Toughbook la laptop that has the ground control equipment on it. It's very durable. Uh, we've operated it every, from everything from 200 foot long ships down to uh, 11 meter long rigid hull inflatable boats, uh, taking waves over the top. You know, it's, it, it works in that environment. Uh, generally, in our configuration, we add uh, we export out the data real time to a large TV monitor. Uh, 
if we're on a big vessel. If not, we, we've incorporated some things that we've, we've uh, just bought on the open market, like gamer goggles, little uh, LCD TV tablets that allow uh, the, the scientists that we're working with to have real-time view of the data without having to uh, bother, if you will. They give direction to the operators of the system. Um, but in, but in ways that uh, you know they don't have to share the same display. You do every once in a while run into people getting seasick by you know looking at these at these monitors, especially at night. So you know there are some there are some problems with that. And we run into rules regularly that, that have to get looked at because as a, as a default we we use the, the same rules for our our pilots when they're flying airplanes when they're flying on aircraft systems. And so. You know, they have to have a flight surgeon tell them they can take any sort of medicine in the middle of the counter. So at first we couldn't, people couldn't take Dramamine or have a scopolamine pass on the boat unless a flight surgeon told them they could. So uh, every time we run into something like that that doesn't make sense as we're building our, our procedures, you know, we get fixed, but sometimes it holds up. So this is a kind of quick view on a bigger boat of what uh, an enforcement being look like. Usually when we do enforcement testing, we, we put together Task Force will work with Cal Fish and Wildlife, Coast Guard, National Park Service down in the Channel Islands, and our own Office of Law Enforcement folks. Um, right now, we're collecting data and demonstrating uh, how these tools can be used. There's uh, policy and, I'll say, uh, privacy concerns have driven the policies that are not allowing us to currently make cases with unmanned aircraft systems, although we can still use them to queue people. Um, so I mentioned the remote video terminals and where we export out the, uh, the signal. Anywhere within the line of sight, and, and for the Puma that's about 20 kilometers from the line, we can tap into that data stream and add another video receiver. It's like a GAN or ground controller. Basically that hand controller uh, that you saw in the earlier slide, they're waterproof. We've put them on rigid hull inflatables too. So even the boarding teams can be looking at aerial imagery of the boat that they're going to be boarding. And that's especially comforting at night teams that they can see what's on the deck, especially if they're looking up in the lights in their, in their boarding boat, uh, as well as the rest of the people supporting them, say, on Coast Guard Cutter or fishing team vessels. So, uh, and some of these fishermen are pretty rough, especially the, the people who work at night. They might be up on the boats. There was one bus where they were actually cooking in on one of the boats. Uh, this was a few years ago, Santa Barbara Channel, the Coast Guard had to figure out what are we doing with this guy? <laughs> you know, so they had to follow them in. <laughs> uh, so the data from the Puma system, it's line of sight. Uh, so if you want to redistribute it to people beyond where you are within this 20 kilometers of line of sight, you have to export it out via, uh, to the internet via satellite or microwave or whatever. And, and we've done a few uh, drills where we have done that, where we've sent real-time full motion streaming data to some command center. It's like, uh, it's like an experiment on top of an experiment. Every time we do it, we, we clunge together uh, in these ways to get the data exported. That might be something you know, for this group or you know, you're willing to consider uh, some of the things we discussed yesterday. Uh, uh, to get remote data out would be, would be very useful. Um, there's a couple slides showing uh, the kind of data you get. You get the telemetry on top every image and it's all recorded in the console and you can exploit it in different ways. But you get the center point of every image, you get the four corners, you get their X, Y, you get slant range, you get the uh, elevation speed of the vehicle, a bunch of other data fields. And we can show these images uh, with or without the telemetry overlays. You can also pull higher resolution images than, than just individual stills that are coming through all the time. You can switch back and forth. You can toggle from infrared to optical. And the IR can, can be shown in either white or black. Um, this is sort of representing a task force. Coast Guard still doesn't allow uh, launch and recovery from their, from their vessels of the aircraft <coughs> systems. But we could get around it, and we have got around this by working on 110 and 80 percent foot cutters by having the active ground control on NOAA vessels and then just sending the passive signal to the cutter. So that's one way we've got around it. 
but I, I think that's all evolving. Just are uh, just starting to uh, be more interested in, in the small system. I want to mention <coughs> environmental parameters. Um, the, the small systems that we've tested, it seems like uh, in the book for the Puma actually we use a 25 knot wind limit you know, for, for, for its envelope. And it all does start to fall apart right about there. Um, it's harder to recover the system. That's just about where it's no fun. You know, it goes fall out of the water, it picks up enough without running over. The images start to lose their stability. You know, this, that's about what that wind can take. Um, We've launched and recovered in higher winds than that, but it, you, know, so you have to think about where you're operating, what the what the conditions are regularly, uh, you know, before you go to deploy the smaller things. And and we've tested the WASP and other other waterproof small UAS as well that that have less limits. So th this seemed to fit us pretty well. The, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll show you some sort of resource. Uh, test slides that, that we've done. This was a, a mock monk seal, a turtle, and a wine that was during some marine retesting we were doing after the tsunami. Uh, to show different scales of the same things we're looking at here. Right? We realized that, you, know, you had to be able to image it to be able to find it. So this was a image of it. Um, we support, supported uh, a lot of different wildlife surveys. This is uh, who whales being attacked in the Santa Barbara Channel. A couple of interesting things about this this image when you think about it. And I'm sorry, this is a beautiful sharp image of the fell apart in PowerPoint. But this was taken uh, when the, uh, with about a 250 foot cloud deck. We were flying under the clouds. And we were able to, this choreography of a whale being tagged with a suction cup tag and a, and a long hole can take an hour or two. To, to get it all synced up so that the rigid hull inflatable is right there at the whale surfaces to get the tag in the right place adjacent to the dorsal and back off without hurting the whale. And so we were able to actually, with the remote video terminal on the rigid hull inflatable, uh, be talking through and the guys could see themselves where the whale was going to surface next so they could be in position. And besides that, some of the later images uh, from the series. They can also verify where on the whale the tag was, was put, and then they could scale the whale in the size of the rib boat against the whale because they know there's a point for long boat. There's a whole lot of information you can get, and it makes it safer for everybody and much more efficient uh, by supporting these with an unmanned aircraft. You couldn't get these shots, and there's an amazing series of shots from how you could do Prop wash and you beat the water up, you'd be in the wrong place at the time. You'd have to go out back and get gas two or three times. So, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things you can do with these. Um, on the Washington Outer Coast, the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, and the Washington uh, National Wildlife Re Refuges along the coast. Um, this summer, we're going back. Um, we'll do our last comparison with the helicopter uh, service that they do annually. Um, the year after that, I think we're just, they're going to stop using the helicopter because we're getting better data. We're not disturbing the critters. We're climbing in 200 feet of them. In their landing in the colony. It depends. Habitat mapping, a whole other discussion we can have about utilities of these things. Um, emergency response, uh, onboard tools where you can lay out digital calipers. This is a simulated oil spill. We're looking at some fluorescent dye in the ocean. Um, you, just, you, you can set a center point, you can measure the drift, the rate of drift and the speed. You can you know, put two axes on it. And, and quantify how big a blob is. Um, this is where you're starting to beat the Mach 1 island. You can actually, uh, you can actually, you know, make a quantitative assessment of how big something is. Um, so here's an IR black hot image on the right of a squid fishing boat in the Channel Islands. Um, you, know, you have everything you need to make a case right there in, in the photo. Something's in the wrong place at the right time. Uh, mentioned the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Uh, this is Turn Island, our big campaign on the Predator this summer. Uh, we've done it. Uh, this is where we'll do a lot of the work and stuff. 350, 400 miles offshore, pretty remote. Uh, we're doing this campaign with NASA because every science campaign gets a name. It's turn, turn, turn. We, we get some time out of it. 
Um, so here's the, the predator that we're going to take out there. We're, now we're talking about a whole other you know, scale and complexity and cost, but, but really sort of unique capabilities where uh, this can fly for 20 hours, it can go more than a couple thousand miles, and has a payload that will actually allow us to quantify every vessel, to, to be able to identify every vessel that we may encounter out, out in that area. And people have been sleeping at night with this sort of little hypothesis that there's nobody out there, except for the people that, that we know are out there because they have these VMS transponders where they provide these notices and get permits. But that may not be true. Um, we're going to be able to, uh, to, to, to prove what a system like this could do. And it'll be really interesting if we do find a person or persons out there that what it's supposed to be. And then that could be a game changer. My opinion, which could be eventually a small UAS being on ships all the time to you know, be able to actually understand the compliance and use of, of, of a vast area like that. But with this system, we'll be able to, uh, the radar actually finds the uh, boats on the surface within, uh, within 100 miles of, of its spot, and then it cues the optics and the infrared. We'll also be able to validate the satellite AIS data that's collected and analyzed. Cross-reference that to, to what, the, what the satellites collect. Um, so this shows you some of the imaging that you can get from a system like this. This is from 20 miles away. So there was a lot of talk yesterday about you know where to conduct tests. And, you know, this slide shows special use airspace. This military airspace that's either warning or restricted areas. And as a federal agency, we can sit in these areas. Some of them cost money, some don't. Um, we've done a lot of work off, in, off uh, Point of View. And this slide depicts the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And that would be the blue boundary, uh, the state <coughs> boundary, and the national park boundary within that. The uh, Channel Islands MPAs are shown in, in red and blue. And then the military warning areas that can be scheduled are all this green area. So you can see the whole Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, except for the east end of Santa Cruz on one side, is within one or another of these. And so by scheduling these areas at the point of view, we're able to uh, fly the online site things that we can't do under a COA or with our agreement with the FAA. Um, similarly, Barking Sands at PMRF allows us to go hundreds of miles offshore in, by working with the military and doing things we can't get a COA for. So my last couple slides, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm running a minute late, um, that I want to mention latency and utility of data real briefly. You know, there's real-time data, that's what you really need for queuing enforcement assets. You can't land 10 hours later and go out and So you've got to have to do it. Um, you know, if it's recording on board, that's great for characterization, post processing, things like that. Uh, and you know, the near real time stuff uh, can be used 